Once upon a time, there was a shoemaker and his wife. The shoemaker worked hard, but he was very poor, and each day he and his wife became poorer and poorer. It was not very long before the shoemaker could only afford one piece of leather to make one pair of shoes. That evening, he cut out the pair of shoes from the leather and left them on his bench to stitch the next morning. The shoemaker and his wife were very sad, for they knew that they would soon be penniless. Early the next morning, the shoemaker went into his workshop to stitch the leather that he had cut. To his surprise, however, there on the bench was a pair of shoes, all ready made and perfectly stitched. The shoemaker picked them up and ran to show his wife, who said, Who has made such a perfect pair of shoes? But neither he nor his wife had any idea who had made them. The very same day, the shoemaker sold the shoes to a lady. She was so overjoyed with their quality that she paid the shoemaker twice the usual price. With this money, the shoemaker was able to buy enough leather for two pairs of shoes, which he cut out that night, all ready for him to stitch in the morning. Early the next morning, the shoemaker went into his workshop to stitch the leather that he had cut. But on the bench were two pairs of shoes, beautifully made, with not a stitch out of place. The same day, a man came to the shop to try on some shoes. When he saw those two perfect pairs of shoes, he was so pleased that he bought them immediately and paid the shoemaker twice the usual price. And so it went on. Four pairs, eight pairs, sixteen pairs, all perfectly made, whilst the shoemaker and his wife were asleep. The shoemaker soon became famous for his beautiful shoes, and he and his wife grew to be very rich. Yet they still had no idea who had made the shoes for them. So, one evening... After the shoemaker had finished cutting the shoes, he and his wife decided to stay up and see who it was who helped them. They hid themselves in a corner of the workshop behind a long curtain, lit a candle, and then waited quietly to see what would happen. Just as the clock struck twelve, the door of the shop opened with a creak. In came two tiny elves. They were dressed in old tatty clothes and their feet were bare. They were unaware that they were being watched by the shoemaker and his wife. The elves began making the shoes that were cut out. They worked so hard and so quickly that they had soon finished. Then they ran quickly away. The next morning, the shoemaker asked his wife, How can we thank these little elves for helping us to be so rich and happy? Why don't we make some clothes for them, said his wife. Their clothes are old and they haven't any shoes. The shoemaker and his wife both agreed that this was a good idea. And in the evenings that followed, they began to make the elves some new clothes. The shoemaker chose the softest leather that he could find to make some little shoes, whilst his wife made two little white shirts, two green jackets, and two pairs of trousers to match. As a final thought, she also made two little caps and knitted two pairs of white socks. It was Christmas Eve when the clothes were finished. The shoemaker and his wife laid the clothes out on the workbench and then hid themselves, as they had done before, and waited for the elves to come. As usual, on the stroke of twelve, the door opened with a creak, 
and in ran the little elves, ready to begin their work. But there were no shoes to make, for there were only the beautiful little clothes laid out on the bench. The elves couldn't believe their luck. They chatted and laughed as they quickly changed into their new clothes, and before long they were ready. They joined hands and danced around the room, finally dancing happily out of the door. The shoemaker and his wife never saw the elves again, but they remained rich and happy, and never forgot those little cobblers who brought them such fortune.
was once a miller who had three sons, a mill, a donkey and a cat. The sons worked in the mill. The donkey carried corn to the mill and the cat chased the mice. One day the miller died and his goods were divided between the three sons. The eldest got the mill. The second eldest inherited the donkey and the youngest got the cat. The youngest son was disappointed with his inheritance. He said, What can I do with a cat? It is of no use to me. But the cat overheard him and said, Oh, master, there is plenty I can do for you. If you have some boots made for me so that I look respectable, I shall make you a wealthy and well-respected man. The miller's son was very surprised to hear the cat speaking to him. However, he felt that he had nothing to lose, and so spent his last money on a pair of fine boots for his cat. As soon as the cat had pulled his boots on, he picked up a sack with a drawstring round its neck, put some corn into it, threw the sack over his back, and marched off on his hind legs. The cat looked so fine in his new boots that the miller's son decided to call him Puss in Boots. Now it was common knowledge that the king of the land was very fond of partridge pie. Yet partridges were clever birds and were very difficult to catch. 
Puss in Boots opened the neck of the corn sack and hid behind some bushes with the end of the drawstring in his hand. Very soon some partridges came to peck at the corn. Puss in Boots waited until there were a good number inside the sack and then pulled on the drawstring which quickly closed it. He then threw the sack over his shoulder and marched off to the palace. Once inside the palace, he marched up to the king and opened the sack. The king was overjoyed to see so many partridges. Where do you come from? asked the king. From my master, the Count Alas de Molino, who has sent you this present. The king was so pleased that in return he gave the cat a sackful of gold to take to his master. The miller's son could hardly believe his eyes when he saw all the gold that Puss in Boots poured from the bag. There, said Puss in Boots, best greetings from the king, who thanks you very much. I shall make you even richer tomorrow, for I've told the king that you are the Count Alas de Molino. The next day Puss in Boots again took the king a bag full of partridges, and whilst he was there discovered that the king and his daughter intended to go for a drive by the lake in their carriage. Puss in Boots hurried home and said to his master, If you would like to be a rich count, come with me to the lake to bathe. The miller's son didn't understand why, but nevertheless he agreed to go. Later on, as he was bathing, Puss in Boots quietly took his master's clothes and hid them. Very soon the king and his daughter, the princess, came along in their carriage. Puss in Boots jumped out and stopped the coach. Oh, please help me, your majesty, said Puss in Boots. My master, the Count Alas de Molino, is bathing in the lake, and he has had all his clothes stolen. The king immediately called to one of his courtiers, A Ride back to the palace and fetch the finest suit of clothes you can find. After the Count had dressed, the king asked to meet the man who had given him all those fat partridges. The princess was also pleased to see the Count. He was tall and handsome, and she liked him very much. The king asked the Count to climb aboard, and they continued on their journey. Puss in Boots had already run on ahead. He came to a huge meadow where people were making hay. He called to a man, Who owns this field? It belongs to the great magician, replied the man. Listen, said Puss in Boots, the king is on his way past. Tell him the field belongs to the Count Alas de Molino. If you do not, the king will be angry. Puss in Boots then ran on to the magician's castle. He approached the magician's throne and said, I have heard that you have such tremendous powers, you can turn yourself into any animal that you wish. I can believe that you can turn into a fox or a lion, but I really can't believe that you can turn yourself into something as mighty as an elephant, for instance. An elephant? roared the magician. That's easy. And with a large puff of smoke, the magician turned himself into a mighty elephant. <coughs> that was wonderful, said Puss in Boots. You have proved to me that you can turn into a big, mighty animal such as an elephant. But I still can't believe that you could turn yourself into a tiny animal, such as a mouse. Even easier, cackled the magician, and in a flash he transformed himself into a small white mouse. In a second, Puss in Boots pounced on the mouse and ate him up. And that was the end of the magician. Meanwhile, the king's carriage had come to the large meadow. The king leaned from the window and asked the man nearest to him, Who does this impressive meadow belong to? To the Count Alas de Molino, came the reply. The king was now very impressed that the count owned such fine fields, and said, Sir Count, you must be a wealthy man. Even my fields are not half so fine. Finally they came to the magician's castle. And there was Puss in Boots, at the head of the flight of gold steps, waiting to welcome them. Welcome to the castle of my master, the Count Alas de Molino, said Puss in Boots. The king admired the Count's land and fine home so much 
that he decided that if the princess wished, he would give the count her hand in marriage. The princess and the count soon became married. And so it came about that after the death of the king, the miller's son became king, and Puss in Boots became prime minister. soul and a merry old soul was he he called for his pipe and he called for his bowl and he called for his fiddlers three <laughs> 